All right. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's epic throwdown in the debate octagon. And I am thrilled to have Dr. Dino and Atheist Jr. here to debate the question, is embryology evidence for evolution? And of course, Atheist Jr. is taking the affirmative tonight with Kent taking the negative. And so I'm excited for tonight's debate. I know everybody in the audience is as well. This is at least Kent and AJ's fourth formal debate, not considering all of the open mic showdowns they've engaged in. So, okay, gentlemen, we're just going to jump right into it. We've got opening statements, 10 minutes, again, the topic, evidence for evolution, but specifically the question, does embryology prove evolution? And so, AJ, we are going to hand it right over to you for 10 minutes. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much, Donnie, uh, for hosting this. And thank you, Kent, for taking the time. So um, this debate is going to be about a uh, topic of embryology. And is it evidence for evolution? And also Ernst Haeckel. So just getting into a biography of, of Haeckel. He was a German and he had many titles, the most relevant being that he was a zoologist. He was a zoology professor. He was a naturalist and he was a, a, a great artist. And he discovered many thousands of new species. He mapped a tree of life and he coined many terms in biology that we still use today, like ecology, phylum, phylogeny, and even Kent's favorite, the protista. So Kent can thank Haeckel every time he mentions a protist from now on. Um, he taught at the University of Jena in 1862 because he was a zoology professor, not an embryology professor. And he developed the no, no longer widely held nor taught recapitulation theory, which is ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which I'm going to talk about that more in my next slide. And he published drawings of different species of vertebrate animals in their embryonic state. Now, these drawings have been very controversial. You could call them really the most controversial photos in the history of science. So ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny versus evo devo. So another term for this is bio, the biogenetic law. So this is the debunked and outdated idea that Haeckel proposed. And it's basically the idea that an organism's embryonic development will take it through each of the adult stages of its evolutionary history or its phylogeny. So Haeckel took this idea way too far when he claimed that vertebrate embryos literally become fish in the womb of mammals. However, Evo Devo is a scientific field of evolutionary development. It's a field of biological research concerned with how changes in the embryonic development during single gestations relate to the evolutionary changes that occur between generations, or basically the relationship between the evolution of an embryo in the womb versus the evolution of the entire species. It only suggests that embryos are similar in their earliest stages, but then they become increasingly different until they, they develop into their adult form, then they're obviously different, like an adult turtle and an adult pig are obviously different, but in the earliest stages of them being an embryo, they do look quite similar, in my opinion. So Haeckel was an amazing artist. You can see, despite these pictures being quite colorful, they're actually, uh, the anatomy is accurate, like the squid and octopi over here. Now, this is the big one. So the embryo drawings. Haeckel observed real vertebrate embryos under the microscope, and he made his drawings alongside these instruments to check for accuracy. But when the deadline to publish the first edition of Anthropogeny came up too fast, Haeckel, in a rush, drew some embryos from memory instead of doing them alongside his tools. But all subsequent editions corrected this mistake. But there was nothing wrong with these drawings in the first place. Haeckel positioned vertebrate embryos in a similar orientation. He showed them at the same stage of development, not the same amount of time that they developed. It's a key difference. And he removed things like a maternal yolk from chicken and salamander embryos. So you're going to see later the pictures comparing Haeckel's drawings to photographs that have uh, sort of a large sac on them. That's an embryo, that's a uh, embryonic yolk because vertebrate embryos, some vertebrates are mammals, but some are, you know, chickens or salamanders that grow in eggs and not the womb. So Haeckel just removed things like the yolk to show the similarities. But even if these embryos didn't resemble each other, all vertebrate embryos share categories 
like having a notochord, a post-anal tail, the pharyngeal arches or gill slits, and a dors dorsal nerve cord. And this would only make sense if these creatures evolved. So here we can see these are photographs, not drawings. And these are the pharyngeal arches or gill slits and the post-anal tail of a human embryo and a chick embryo. Now, um, I've heard a lot of creationists talk about Haeckel's supposed uh, trial that he was held, uh, uh, that a university court convicted him of fraud. But I would like Kent to provide uh, evidence of this and prove it because I really don't see any evidence of this court trial ever happening except from creationist websites. So I'd love to get some evidence for this claim. And here we have a quote from Richardson. So Kent is going to show the really famous uh, picture that's a comparison of Haeckel's drawings to a comparison of photographs. That was done by a guy named Richardson. And here we have a quote from Richardson saying, I am concerned to find that I may have helped perpetuate a creationist myth. The claim that Ernst Haeckel was convicted of fraud was made in the Times. I relied on that statement in the subsequent publication without seeking a primary source, clearly a mistake on my part. And even Wikipedia says, while it has been widely claimed that Haeckel was charged with fraud by five professors and convicted by a university court at Jena, there does not appear to be an independently verifiable source for this claim. Also, Haeckel supposedly was found guilty of fraud and then continued to work at the University of Jena for three more decades. And here we have uh, a picture from one of Ken's videos, a screenshot of him showing a microphotograph of an embryo and showing the pharyngeal arches or gill slits as they're called. And you can see where it's marked one, two, three, four. And I'm just going to skip this slide. Um, here we have a quote from uh, Icons of Evolution saying that Darwin concluded the early embryos show us more or less completely the condition of the progenitor and the whole group in its adult state. In, a, in other words, similarities in early embryos not only demonstrate that they are descended from a common ancestor, but also reveal what that ancestor looked like. And says Darwin considered this by fact, by by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory. So Darwin was saying that um, embryology was the strongest class of facts, not the biogenetic law. That's that's something that Icons of Evolution says, which is a creationist book that Kent quoted. But I'm going to show the actual quote from Darwin's letter in a second. So this is a this is an important one. Um, gill slits versus gills. So gill slits refers to the pharyngeal arches that every vertebrate species have as embryos. And this would only make sense unless they evolved. These are being structures that can become gills, does not make them gills like a fish has. The term gill slits is a misnomer. I think it's a lousy term and we shouldn't use it. But people like can't take advantage of this fact to lie and say that textbooks are teaching your kids that human embryos literally have gills like a fish, but they don't. So he'll try to do this in this debate. And the structures are identical in human and fish embryos. So human and fish embryos in their early stages both have identical structures. They just turn into different structures in, in the adult form. In humans, they're uh, part of the ear and throat. And in fish, they do become gills. So in humans, they develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. In fish, they develop into gills. And pharyngeal arches are not just folds of skin. Each arch has a a cartilaginous support, but also an artery, nerve, and muscle element. So I'm going to say this slowly and use small words so maybe Kent will get it. Human embryos never have gills like a fish. Gills are not the same thing as gill slits. These are Haeckel's supposed fake drawings. And I would just like to ask Kent, this is my last slide, or, or second to last, but just which one is a human embryo? Because in this slide, I have one of these is a human embryo, but we also have dog, pig, salamander, lizard, uh, fish embryo. So I think these look pretty similar. I'll leave it up to the audience to decide what they think. And I just have a few more slides. Um, is a biogenetic law taught in textbooks? No, it's not. A recent survey of 36 textbooks dating from 1980 to, to the present and covering high school biology college biology and advanced college biology found that only eight of these textbooks mentioned Haeckel or the biogenetic law. And two of these were creationist books of pandas and people and biology for Christian school from Bob Jones University Press. And of the six mainstream textbooks that were mentioned that mentioned Haeckel or the biogenetic law, two are advanced level college books. In the case where Haeckel is mentioned, the text doesn't reproduce Haeckel's mistakes. 
and data from, this is a quote from Richardson, again, who is the person who made the famous picture comparing the drawings to the photographs. Data from embryology are fully consistent with Darwinian evolution. Haeckel's famous drawings are creationist cause. Early versions show young embryos looking virtually identical to a different, in different vertebrate species. On a fundamental level, Haeckel was correct. And these are just some textbooks showing that modern textbooks do not use drawings, they use microphotographs. And Kent should know this because he's even shown a textbook showing microphotographs. So do modern textbooks use Haeckel's drawings? No, and if they do, I agree with Kent that those textbooks should not be in circulation, that they should replace those micro, they should replace those with microphotographs because photographs are always gonna be more accurate than drawings. And that'll that's the end of my my slideshow. So thank you. All right, AJ, thank you very much for that 10 minute <coughs> opening statement here on our uh, debate. Okay, let me get those slides out of the way and we'll now hand it over to Kent. Allow me to restart the timer and Kent, you've got 10 minutes for your opening statement. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. All right, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Patterson. Your entire channel is built on trying to pick on me. You're riding on my coattails, obviously, trying to get more subscribers and views. Uh, by you. Every time I do a program, you will take it and do it. So you just gave me in the last 10 minutes enough to, to go for a long time, debunking a lot of what you just said, okay? And I'll be thrilled to do that when I get time. Uh, Haeckel had a lot of titles, okay? Uh, I'll go through that later and independently stop, pause, and like you do with mine, stop, pause, and make my comments and correct the record, okay? Just because embryos may look alike, uh, there's still huge differences. What about the DNA code? What about the chromosome number? You guys, so they look similar on the outside. Actually, they don't. We'll cover that in a minute. But even if they did, that still is not evidence for evolution. You guys are so desperate to believe your grandpa was a monkey and you all came from a dot of nothing exploding. You want so badly to get rid of God and get rid of his laws and his rules in this book, you'll believe anything. You believe, you will believe you're related to a potato and a frog rather than in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That just, for some reason, bothers you. We'll talk about that. So you mentioned, <clears throat> well, I have to take that piece at a time. Here's the Hovind translation. This guy said in this textbook here, a biology textbook, college book, humans and fish embryos resemble each other because humans and fish share a common ancestor. This is the logic. Because the embryos look similar, they have a common ancestor. Obviously, the other side of that would be maybe they have a common designer. Maybe the same God designed them all. That's not evidence for evolution. Could be just as much evidence for a common designer. The embryo is unbelievably complex, way more complex than the space shuttle. One little embryo, the DNA code found in that little embryo is more complex than the computer system of New York City. It's, it's, to believe that happened by chance is crazy, okay? Darwin said this is by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory. And Haeckel, as you mentioned, called it the biogenetic law. This textbook says they have tails and gill pouches. Those are not even gill slits. Why do you use the word gill? Not unrelated. They develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. Why would you be sure to include the word gill with the description of a human embryo, when they never have gills, they never develop into gills, humans never have gills. See, the evolution dumb religion says we started off like a fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal, just memorize the word farm, F-A-R-M. We all became a fish, we evolved into a fish, and then an amphibian, and then a reptile, then a mammal. This is what you want to be true, okay? And you're desperately looking for any evidence to support that stupid idea that we evolved from a fish, amphibian, reptile, finally became a mammal, okay? So they never have anything to do with breathing. Why would you be deceitful and use the word gill or gill slit or gill pouch? Why would you do that? They're not gills at all. Why would you use the de deceptive word and say it has a tail? No, it doesn't have a tail. The backbone grows first, the frame of the body grows first, and then the attachments go on it. That's the way they build just about everything. So those are not gill slits. They never have anything to do with breathing. Haeckel said when he read Darwin's book, that turned him around. See, Haeckel was another guy who wanted badly to get rid of God in his life. 
get rid of this God idea and let's figure out a way we can live without God telling us what to do. He read Darwin's book and said, and you, you, you justified his drawings. AJ, I can't believe you would do that. The drawings, that, the fake drawings that Haeckel used are still used today. He took a dog embryo at four weeks, a human embryo at four weeks, and changed them. He increased the size of the head on the dog and decreased the size of the head on the human. This isn't bad artwork. This is lying. This is being deceitful. He was a fraud. Now, if you want to make him your hero, you can worship wherever you want. But the guy's a liar and a fraud. Tell him I said so. The eye details were changed. The length was changed. He made lots of mis This guy was... He knew what he was doing. He did it deliberately. Haeckel's doctored drawings of dog and human embryos as they appeared in his book, History of Creation. On top are the drawings like they should have been. Underneath are his fake drawings. This is the chart that you showed, and I can't believe you are still defending this. This is the chart, Haeckel's famous drawings, 1874. Underneath are the photographs that Richardson took. Now, if Richardson is not a creationist, I don't care. It doesn't matter. He's an embryologist, and he studied these things and said, look, Haeckel's drawings are not accurate. And you justified Richardson a couple times. I'll do that when I take this apart, your 10-minute uh, opening, slice by slice, okay? Uh, and I don't know about the university court. The fact that I don't have the records that there was a university court doesn't mean there wasn't one. You're trying to imply until we can prove there was one that it didn't happen. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. I, just don't, I don't have any evidence. I've never thought about looking for some, okay? But forget the court. The fact is, he didn't draw accurate drawings. And he was, as you showed, an excellent artist. And what do you mean he didn't have time to get the drawings right for his book? Well, then he shouldn't have published the book yet. You hold it off, hold off publication until you get it right. Okay, he was being deceitful. And I think he knew it, and I think you know it, okay? According to the university trial that I read about, uh, <clears throat> he should feel, he said, I should feel condemned, but except everybody else lies, okay? The biogenetic law has become so deeply rooted in biological thought, it cannot be weeded out, in spite of having been demonstrated to be wrong by numerous scholars. Science Magazine, this is 55 years ago. They know it's not true. The biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail, American Scientist Magazine, okay? 19th century drawings appear in reference books are badly misdrawn, says an embryologist in Britain, St. George Medical School. Haeckel confessed to drawing from memory and was convicted of fraud at the university. That's the real mystery, said Richardson, okay? So Richardson claimed there was a university trial. He said he was convicted of fraud. Richardson says he was, and he's not a, a creationist. I collect biology textbooks. I've got a whole bunch of them here, and his drawings appear in almost all of them. And the idea, the whole purpose of this debate tonight is for you to provide evidence or for you to demonstrate why you believe Embryology supports evolution, and it doesn't. There is no evidence from embryology to support the idea that we're all related. I know you would like to be related to a potato and a banana and a frog. You would like that. And you would like for this book to not be true. I know you would like that, but use some real science. This embryology stuff is not science. Here we go. Irish textbook, when I was over in Ireland, I photographed theirs. They used the same drawings from Haeckel. And our textbook says, the presence of these fish-like structures. Why would a wrinkle of skin be a fish-like structure? Why would you refer to it as a gill pouch? Why don't you refer to it as a, a suit jacket pocket or a glove compartment on a car? It's a fold of skin. Don't use the word gill in association with it. That's deceitful. These shows these animals evolve from fish and share the basic pattern. It's used all over the world. This stupid idea, and it's not true. Haeckel, Darwin wrote his book, 1859. Haeckel made his drawings in 1869, proven wrong in 1874. If I, I'll double check on the university trial, okay? Maybe the records got burned up. They've had quite a few wars over there in Germany. I don't know if there's any evidence or not. Maybe the whole university got blown up. I don't know, but that, that doesn't matter. The fact is, they're not true. The drawings are not correct. Doesn't matter if there was a trial. It's not correct. Biology textbook. Our embryos show our evolutionary history. No, they don't. And they're calling them gill slits again. This is not gill slits. Stop using that word. Still teaching that at a university. They're not educating students. They're indoctrinating them. 
Holt Biology, one of the major four major publishers in America, still telling them it has gill pouches and a bony tail on a chicken and a human. They lied. This is a bold-faced lie. Glencoe Biology, another major publisher, showing the embryo at four weeks with a tail and gill slits. Why do you use the word gill? Evolution and the myth of creationism, Tim Barra, still use the fake drawings. This is all you guys have, AJ. All you have to support your religion is lies, forgeries, frauds. There is no evidence at all for evolution, none. You guys have these family trees that you like very much, and I appreciate your zeal and your defense of your religion, and no question, but these family trees that they're showing are pure propaganda. This isn't science to say that a frog and a sunflower have a common ancestor. That's not only not science, that's stupid. If you wish to believe that, you can believe whatever you want. But don't pollute science with a stupid religion like that. But they're still teaching this embryology stuff, okay? Here they go, Holt Science, another one of the four major publishers for public school textbooks, which I collect, got hundreds of them here, okay? Still showing, they didn't use the more modern photographs that Richardson took, this is 1998. They knew a long time before that that the drawings were not accurate. They're still calling it gill slits. Stop. Pick a new name, but not gill pouch, not gill slits, and certainly not gills. 20 seconds. Okay. Haeckel's fake drawings downloaded today from biolibrarytext.org. Yeah, they're still teaching it. Ken, I don't think we're them. seeing your slides. Oh, what happened? Okay, stay on the ball over there, brother. Okay. Okay, they're back. I downloaded, downloaded this today. Uh, still teaching, ha using Haeckel's fake drawings. Comparative embryology, the study of similarities and differences of embryos at different stages, different species. Uh, and this is valuable to compare organisms in the embryonic stage. This is all you guys have. I know you're desperately trying to cling to evidence of your theory. Okay, sorry, it's dumb. Downloaded today. Embryonic development. If there are similarities in the way various animals develop, what does that prove? They're the same designer. Or maybe it's a practical way for them to form, develop. Is it logical to begin the assembly of a car, starting with the frame, and then add the motor and the body? Or should you put the body first and then the frame? How about That's a golf car? Okay. All right, Kent, thank you very much for the 10-minute opening statement. Thanks to the both of you. Appreciate the visuals. Since we do have several points on the table within the greater topic of embryology, why don't we each, to be fair, I want to keep it as equally timed as possible. Let's each take two minutes to, I guess, respond to the points or, or rebut each other and, and say whatever we'd like to. So AJ, let's throw it to you. Two minutes uninterrupted. Then we'll do the same for Kent. Go ahead. Okay, so this uh, debate is about embryology, not uh, my channel, so stay on topic. And you're asking why I would call them gills. I said that I think gill slits is a bad term. I don't like it because it's confusing. I agree with you that it's, a, it's not a good term, but call it whatever you want. The pharyngeal arches are there on vertebrate embryos, on human embryos. So you can call the structure what you want, but you can't deny the fact that they're there because you've shown photographs of them in your slides and uh the drawings are fake i mean again even even if the drawings are are not good it doesn't matter because we have micro photographs now so we can throw the drawings out i personally don't think that they are fake but those are drawings from 150 years ago and they don't affect modern embryology or modern science they're just part of the history of science and as for telling Haeckel he's a fraud, I'm not sure how I could do that because he's been dead for over 100 years. And I'm, I'm, unless you can prove that there was a trial, it doesn't mean there was one. Yeah, that's how that's how that works. You have to provide evidence. If you make a claim and you've said over and over again that he was convicted of fraud, you need to provide evidence of that. So either prove it or stop saying it. And he shouldn't have published his book if he was rushed. I agree with you. That was a mistake that Haeckel made, you know. He was, he was a human. He, he's only human. He made mistakes. But I don't think that means that he was a fraud. And the biogenetic law being dead, it is dead. That's why it's not taught in modern textbooks. Show me a textbook that teaches the, the biogenetic law. Uh, as for Richardson claiming there was a trial, yeah, he claimed that. And then he rescinded his claim saying that he contributed to a creationist hoax. So he, he said it. And then he said, oops, I was wrong. Um, as for evidence from embryology for evolution, I think now uh, I'm going to say that this is likely that it's evidence of evolution. But the fact that 
All vertebrate embryos share those structures, the post-anal tail, the pharyngeal arches, um, the dorsal nerve cord. I think that's evidence that they evolved from a common ancestor. And you can say that's evidence of a common designer, but I, I haven't seen any evidence from you that that it is a common designer because you seem to just say when somebody claims that this is evidence for common ancestry, you just seem to say, no, I think it's evidence for common designer, but you don't provide your evidence of your own. As for me, believing that the Bible would not be true, I, I don't think you can read minds, Kent, so I'm not sure that you know what I believe or don't believe. And for Darwin um, saying that he needs evidence, two years after he published On the Origin of Species, he predicted when he published it that they would find a, a uh, bird fossil with fused wing fingers, and two years later they did, which was Archaeopteryx. So there was evidence only two years after. And I'm not sure why Haeckel would have waited okay. nine years to create evidence if Darwin needed evidence so badly. Why wait a decade to fake the drawings then? Okay, AJ, appreciate it. That was uh, three minutes. So thank you for that. Kent, we'll throw it back to you. You have three minutes to respond. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Well, I'm excited to hear uh, Mr. Patterson say uh, that if you make a claim, you have to prove it or stop using it. You are making the claim that all life forms are related. You believe you are related to a mosquito and to a whale and because you, you believe you have a common ancestor with these things. It's a claim. You made the claim, prove it. Show me. Show me any animal ever producing offspring other than their kind. Cows produce cows, dogs produce dogs, whales produce whales. There are no exceptions, none. So you're making a claim that all these things are related and you, none, no evolutionist has ever proven such a thing. You're desperately seeking for some kind of evidence like the similarity of the, of the gills. This is insane. They are still using it. I, you, I'm glad you asked. Show me a textbook that still uses it today. There are hundreds of them. I'll put together a whole presentation just for you. They're still using, here we go. This one, evidence of evolution downloaded today. Embryonic development. Embryos of various species show similar structure similar structure till a certain period of gestation. For example, the human embryos of humans, pigs, reptiles, and bills, get, get birds, show similar uh, embryonic development. They develop into the specific species as they grow. This again shows common ancestry. No, it does not. It shows a common designer. It maybe shows a great way for things to be developed. As I said, Maybe it's a practical way for them to develop. You start with the frame for a car. They start with the frame for a golf cart, the frame for a truck, motorcycle. They start construction by building the frame. Here's the frame uh, of a motor of a four-wheeler. Here's the frame of a snowmobile. So that proves that the car, the snowmobile, the four-wheeler, and the golf cart all have a common ancestor. This is your logic. It's a, it's a practical way to start building any complex thing like a human body by starting with the backbone first and then developing the organs onto that. That would be logical to do that. I think you'll find when they build a building, they build the frame first, and you don't hang the lights before you have the roof on and the building up. You gotta build the floor, build the walls, there's a sequence, I've built many houses. So I think you're, you're simply mistaken, claiming that this is somehow evidence for evolution, and I'm glad to hear you, I'll use that, believe me, the rest of your life and my life on about you claim, if I make a claim, you gotta prove it. You're making a claim that these charts are accurate or similar, close to accurate, and that they should be taught in our public schools. That's your claim. You think this is ought to be taught, and you think everybody should be required to pay for this, don't you? So that's your claim. I'd like you to prove it. I will get more stuff on Richardson, <clears throat> if he did indeed recant, maybe to keep his job or something else, maybe because of peer pressure from all other people. Or you're going to be a creationist. You can't work at St. George Medical School. Who knows? You guys do know how to put a lot of pressure on people who don't believe like you to quit. Uh, Muslims do the same thing in their country. You don't believe in Islam? Oh, you don't think he was a prophet? Take off Ten his seconds. head. Well, now they just lose the job. Okay, don't take, quite take off the head. Well, good. I got plenty of notes, Donnie. I'm going to get put together a whole bunch on this. We're going to debunk this one thoroughly. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Kent. AJ, let's throw it back to you and feel free to take another, let's say, couple minutes and we'll keep going uh, with this flow for a little while. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of, I'm not even going to comment on the last thing. Um, well, I would like uh, to talk about if I could share my my screen again. Um, that's okay with you, Donnie, because um, I I didn't get to ask Kent this because it was during my opening. Um, but 
which okay so which one of these do you think is a human embryo kent oh kent's muted kent i think you got to unmute on your end muted or not yeah my good now yeah, I don't know and I don't care. It doesn't matter. I'm not an embryologist. I could probably look at it and study it and figure it out. But what, what difference does that make? If I cannot because, identify which one is a human, uh, does that prove evolution? Does that prove, their, their, does that prove your point of embryology? Come on, do better than that. Well, yes, it would because I'm claiming that the vertebrate embryos look the same. You're claiming that Haeckel lied when saying that the uh, vertebrate embryos look similar and that he's a fraud and that he made all that up. But I'm showing yeah. photogra photographs here that show that I, in my opinion, at least they do look very similar. You didn't ask me if I, if they look the same, you asked me to pick out which one was human. That's a very and different you, topic. I, the fact that the, they, they're all look, they all look different, but I don't know which one's a human. That should you're be obvious. The, you're, not, you're missing the point completely. The fact that I don't know which one is a human does not mean they all look the same. Look at them. They don't all look the same. You tell me which one is the mouse. There's not a mouse embryo on here. You sure? Yeah, I found the pictures. Okay. okay. Can you identify each one? If you can yeah. identify each one, apparently they look different, don't they? Because you can tell which one's the human and which one's the bird. I know so which one is the human, different. but I made, the, I made the slide, Kent. Of course I know which I know. is which. I know, but listen to me. The fact that you can pick out which one is the human indicates they don't all look the same. Because if they all look the same, they'd all look like that human, wouldn't they? Look at them. They don't all look the same. They don't but look don't identical, but they look similar. I think they look okay. similar. You don't think they look similar? The top row, at least. You're missing the point completely. The fact that they look a little bit similar at this stage of development, do they all have the same amount of DNA? Do they all have the same number of chromosomes? Are they actually similar? You're just going by looks? Come on. I mean, that's important. Yeah, why, why would they I mean, look the same if they were if they weren't evolved from a common ancestor? Because that's they have my the evidence. Same because they have the same designer. My little Honda Insight looks like a Corvette. Whoa. Doesn't mean a thing. It's a good design that works. It's aerodynamic. You're missing the point. Do, answer my question. Do these things, do these creatures you have here have the same number of chromosomes? Yes or no? No, probably not. Sure. Do they have the same amount of DNA code? I don't know what that means, the same amount of DNA. Well, this chromosome contains little lines across it, you know, the CATG. The, the DNA code, the, the number of the genetic code, okay, do they have the same code? If you took the code out of one of those and let it keep developing like it wants to, would it develop into, would all of them, is there any chance that that code would make it turn into something other than what it started off to be, like the human? Is there any chance that DNA code in that human embryo would turn it into anything other than a human? Or is it designed to become a human if you leave it alone? Uh, that's a loaded question, but no, it would not turn into anything else, but it's also not designed to, it's not designed in the first place. But what did you say that the uh, rungs of the ladder are on the DNA, uh, on the double helix? Well, the DNA code, the chromosome is a, like a long twisted ladder. That is the code to make everything. And I pointed out many times that if you want to, computer, want to computerize a robot to grab a glass, you want to get your robot to grab the glass or cup. You'd have to make it in the, in the humans, you have the flexors and extenders, uh, flexors and muscles on the front. You'd have to tell that a whole line, a whole bunch of lines of code to tell that robot, bend your fingers, bend each one. OK, there's probably thousands of lines of code required to get your robot to pick up a cup just to reach down and pick up a cup. There's probably thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of lines of code to make the robot pick up the cup. You might have similar lines of code in a human to grab your hand around something and similar lines of code in a monkey to grab something. That's because the same guy wrote the code. This is not evidence that nobody wrote the code. I don't know how you can't see it. There are similarities when you build a vehicle and you want to start with the frame first. That's logical. They got the same for the car, the golf cart, the truck, the motorcycle. That's logical. And I would bet we could look at these frames carefully and find out some of them used bolts and nuts. Some of them used rivets. Some of them used welded joints. Look at that. Look at the similarity. Some are welded, some are, you're missing it. 
the fact that there are similarities between these embryos and even between these animals. When they're full grown, there's still some similarities. They all breathe air, they all use up oxygen, give off CO2. It's a design feature. Why are you running from the designer, AJ? I'm not. So if, if, the, if the similarities prove a common designer, then what do the differences show? In ingenuity. General Motors can take the same concept and take an assembly line and build trucks or cars or anything they want. It's a concept. It's a construction project. It's a sequence of events. You build the frame first and then add the details to it. It shows we've seen people design. build cars today. You already know that people have designed cars because we've seen people build them today. We've never Bingo. seen the Christian God design the universe or design a human or an animal. So therefore, it didn't happen? Is that your logic? Therefore, we have better evidence for cars being designed than we do for humans. But you're comparing them like we have the exact same amount of evidence, but we don't. Well, I'd say a human is trillions of times more complex than any car ever built, okay? Trillion, maybe quadrillions or quintillions, okay? But that, the fact that we see similarities in the construction sequence, I think, is good indication. We know somebody had to think it out. You know, if we're going to build a car, we really should start with the frame and then put the tires on. I think it'd be good to have the frame and the body before you put the windows in, okay? That's a good logical sequence of events. I think God, in his infinite wisdom, designed all the animals to develop along a certain series of events. And you look at the similarity of that events, event sequence and claim there's no God, there's no designer that did it. I don't, I don't know how you can't see this. I, I, I'm baffled. But I think the evidence is overwhelming. Somebody designed all the embryos, and somebody designed them to do what they do. And they slowly turn into whatever they're destined to be. The chicken embryo turns into a chicken. And that one chicken embryo is capable of turning into a chicken that's capable of making more chickens. Great, 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 great grandpa chicken had the DNA code that is making copies off of copies off of copies off of copies. It's marvelous how it works. I don't have a problem praising God for designing the amazing DNA code and the body structure of all the plants and animals. I just praise God. Thank you, God. You don't well, have good to give up for your you. So are you going to stop saying that Haeckel was found guilty of fraud since there's no evidence for this trial? That's what was fraud. Was it your claim of a trial? That's fake. Not oh, the drawing. No, you don't know that it isn't true. You're claiming there is no evidence. That's a line you always go to. OK, there is no evidence for anything on this chart. No evidence for these lines connecting a whale and a sunflower. There's no evidence for that. There's lots of evidence against it. All the evidence shows whales always make baby whales. So why would we be, all have to pay to teach the kids that the whale and the sunflower have a common ancestor? There's no evidence for that. Where's the evidence of any animal in history producing something other than their kind? People you didn't have answer my question, though. Water. Are you going to stop saying that there was a trial because there wasn't one? So are you going to stop saying oh, that? No, I believe there was one. I will do some research. But You have no many evidence. People have, many people have said that there was. And this is like you said, a long time ago, Haeckel's been dead Only a long time. Creationists. Only creationists have, say that there was okay. one. Well, let's forget the trial. Let's forget it. The fact is he didn't give accurate drawings. The drawings were fudged and forged. Would you agree the initial drawings that he made are not accurate? Would you at least agree to that? Hold on a second. Can, so are you going to stop saying that you there was a trial? Or you're going to keep saying it with no evidence? I don't know. I'll think about that. Are you going to stop saying you, evolution is true because we know we have a common ancestor? Are you going to stop saying this chart represents science? No, but the difference is that I have evidence for that. You have none for this trial, but you're going to oh, keep saying it anyway. Now you're claiming, you're, you make a claim now, back it up. Where is the evidence of any animal producing something that you or anybody would consider a different kind? They have a protozoa or an amoeba turning into everything on the chart. Where is the evidence? You, you claimed it now. Where's the evidence of a protozoa or an amoeba or whatever one you want, bacteria? Start with a single cell creature. Where is the evidence of any single cell creature becoming anything on this chart? They're claiming the protozoa became everything here. Wow, the dinosaurs, the birds, the humans, the whales, the hippopotamus. This is the claim that we're all paying to put in the public school textbook. So where is your evidence, Mr. Patterson, that all these creatures, that, that start with a single cell creature. Where is your evidence that it turned into a whale? Do you mind not using my last name publicly, Kent? That's considered doxing, and it's very rude. You're, I mean, is this, is this? You're upset about I, I never, 
Yeah, I never put that publicly. Okay, guys, let's get back on track. If if uh, AJ doesn't want his last name used, we'll respect that. Let's get right back to the topic, embryology. AJ, you were responding. Go ahead, and then we'll throw it back to Ken. Well, let me get one more yeah. thought, though. Why, why do we have to use your fake name? Your real name's not Atheist Junior. So your initials this is are not AJ. relevant. This is irrelevant. Well, then, okay, then it's not relevant. Right. But okay, let's go back to embryology. AJ, they do not stand for Atheist Junior. You made up a title to look important. Okay, so... Okay. I'm going to answer my evidence for common ancestry because your question had a straw man of evolution. So my evidence for common ancestry is that the vertebrate, or at least for the vertebrate embryos, the common ancestry is that they have the pharyngeal arches. All vertebrate embryos share pharyngeal arches. They share a post anal tail and a dorsal nerve cord. That's my evidence that they evolved from a common ancestor. And also That's the fact that fish embryos and human embryos and vertebrate embryos look similar in their early stages, which I think you agreed to, I'm not sure, but you seem to agree to with it. Okay, so your evidence that you have a relationship with the fish and everything else is the embryos look similar. Would you agree that in a court of law, anybody, a freshman law student could say, your honor, they may look similar. This has nothing to do with it. Do they have different number of chromosomes? Yes. Do they have a different amount of DNA code? Yes. Do they have, do they grow into something very, very different? Yes. So your evidence that they look similar at one stage is silly, real silly. You've well, been you, suckered. You claim that Haeckel lied when he said that they look similar. So was that a lie? Did he actually lie about that? Haeckel's the one who faked the drawings to make them look similar. But I showed Didn't you micro photographs that showed they look similar though. Okay, here, put my slides, there you go. Bottom row. These are the micro photographs that Richardson took. They don't look similar. Look at them. They don't look, look at, similar. Look We're at talking the, something the this big, okay? This big. So I would what? say a cube so of salt small? and a grain of sand might look similar, but they're not. This is such weak evidence to, to, to make all of us pay that this chart represents science. This chart so, represents nothing but a religious worldview. Nothing else. So uh, looking at columns three and five, you're telling me that those don't look similar? Or just column three, the turtle? Those two embryos the don't turtle. look similar. The... Why are you so desperate on them looking similar at a certain stage? Could you answer the it's question? It's the way they develop. They started off as a sperm and an egg. All of them did. And from the very moment, the sperm and the egg, before the sperm and egg even touched each other, there were different numbers of chromosomes in there. They were different before they ever came together. They have a totally different DNA code. I would say the computer, uh, a thumb drive to produce uh, one computer program might look similar to a thumb drive to produce a totally different program. You might say a video game that you enjoy playing. This comes on a thumb drive. You stick it in. Wow, it plays Zelda or whatever. That might that thumb drive might look similar to another thumb drive. Well, that proves they're the same. No. How can you not see this? Are do you the saying, thumb I mean, look, hey, do, do all thumb drives look similar? No. They don't. No, but it's irrelevant because thumb drives can't have a relationship. With, they can't be related to each other. They're not biological organisms. They're inert. Here we go. I don't even know what's on them. Look at this. Oh, this one's black and this one's blue, but they're similar. Now look at this now. They fold, both of them fold out. Both of them have a USB port, two, two square holes on both sides. Aha, uh -huh. look at that. And a little ring at the top. That proves these are both identical. I don't even know what's on them. Doesn't matter. They're both the same. These both have the same information on them. The information contained in the DNA code of these embryos is different. The information on these thumb drives may be probably totally different. I don't care. It don't matter. The point is, the fact that they look similar is meaningless, real meaningless. It's really not. So um, do you agree that, uh, that human embryos have the pharyngeal arches? I won't call them gill slits because I think that's a bad term, but do you agree that the pharyngeal arches are there on a human embryo? What do you mean by pharyngeal arches? Do you mean that little folds of skin? I got the same thing in my elbow when I bend my arm. I can't breathe through it. Call I bet you, you do. If you bend, your arm, bend your arm and do you, have, do you have folds of skin right there where your arm bends up? Everybody does. Can you breathe through them? Could you ever breathe through them in the past? It's a fold of skin. Why are you calling it a pharyngeal arch? Do human embryos have them? I think they have folds of skin because they're bent over. 
they're growing inside a little bitty uh, egg that is trying to stretch and grow. Of course, they're bent over in it. I bet when you bend over, you got you still got folds of skin here. I bet when you bend over, you got folds of skin in your belly. Everybody does. What does this? This doesn't mean anything. They they're not just folds of skin. They have arteries, nerve supports, and muscles in them, and cartilage cartilaginous support. So the do the human embryos skin? have them? Well, the folds of skin in your elbow also have blood supply and nerve supply and uh, the skin. There's a lot of similarities between the folds of skin in your elbow and the folds of skin in your belly. Yeah, but wow. I'm not an embryo, Kent. I'm not an embryo right now. So I'm just asking, I'd like a yes or no. Do human embryos have those structures? Human embryos have folds of skin uh, or folds under what is going to become their head, okay? Uh, the frame to a motorcycle has, has rivets like the frame to a car does. That proves nothing other than it's a good design feature. This thing is growing inside a little bitty embryonic sac that is swelling with it. It grows in the curled up fetal position, why they call it a fetus. It's in the fetal position. And of course, the fact that those folds of skin can later become something totally different, bones in the ear and glands in the throat, has nothing to do with breathing. You're so desperate to want to be related to a frog and a potato that you think because they have folds of skin with cartilage in them. Whoa. I didn't study if you got cartilage in the folds of skin in your elbow. I don't know. Maybe so. There's certainly yeah. your nerve supply and blood supply. What difference would that yeah. make? They have nothing to do with breathing in human embryos. You're right. That's because they turn into completely different structures in the f adult fish and they're different structures in the adult human. That's because right. that's how evolution works is it's using the same structure to create two different structures in the adult organism because it's, or evolution just works with what it has in uh, the, the early stages. Now, I'm not saying that it's a guided process or that evolution is a conscious process. It's incidental, but that's how it works. At least I'm arguing that that's how it works. Okay, now this textbook says, I've got it underlined in red. I don't know if you can see it. They have fish like structures. So are you going to stop using the gills word with this stuff, with embryos, and stop using the fish like structures? I mean, I, I don't like using the term gills, so I agree with you there, but they are fish like in, in that fish embryos have that same structure. All vertebrate embryos share these same structures. That's what I've been saying. Well, since, the, since in the human, those folds of skin develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. Why don't you call the fish, the folds in the fish embryo, human-like structures? Let's start calling could, them all human-like structures instead of fish-like structures. They're all human-like structures. That's that's a good point. You could call them that because they are okay. identical. They're not identical. Yeah, they're in the like. early embryos, the pharyngeal arches are identical in these two uh, different species of embryos. Okay, explain what you mean by the word pharyngeal arches. You mean folds of skin? If you want to call them folds of skin, then yeah, they're they're um, arches, and then they're they're the re I guess the reason they call them slits is because they have a line that's going down in between the the folds. Um, but um, I, if I could, uh, I don't think I need to show the slide again. But yeah, it's it's just they do they do look like folds because. Um, each of those individual nodules turns into like a different part. Like one becomes a eustachian tube in the ear and another goes to become the glands in the throat. And I in fish, they develop into the gills. Those, those, they're not slits, but in the embryo, the, in the adult, they are slits. I bet if you watched any factory building cars or motorcycles or snowmobiles or Jeeps, there would be rolls of steel coming in that they would then roll out and punch them into the parts that they need. But if you watch it, when they first come into the factory, they're all rolls of steel. What does that prove? It's a good way to build stuff. It's a design feature. They're designed, AJ. They're designed. But you know those are designed because we can see people building cars today. Again, we don't see people designing fish or designing humans. Okay, if, we did, if nobody ever saw people designing cars, would you then conclude that, that they evolved? If nobody ever saw, we see the embryos growing into what the mature adult look like. We see fish produce baby fish every time. We don't ever see them anything else. There are similarities. Now, 
I don't think it's off topic, Donna. You decide on this. But I, I'd like to see why do they defend this embryo stuff so much? Number one, they want to prove their evolution religion. Number two, they want to justify abortion. It's not a human yet. It's just a fish, isn't it? At a certain stage of development, is the human embryo a fish? And then it becomes an, rept an amphibian, reptile, mammal. So it's okay to justify killing it until it reaches a certain stage. Is that the justification? This is a complete red herring and is not on topic. It's exactly on topic, but it may be, a, that's why I said it may be a, a rabbit trail from this, but it certainly ties in. You want to use this idea that it's, as it grows in the mother, it's got fish structures. It's just a fish, boys and girls. This is the logic they use to justify abortion. No, because is, is that, that a is topic biogenical. you guys want to is that a topic you guys want to chase for a little bit or should we move I'm right ready. back? Anytime. I'm not interested in talking about that. Okay. So let's shift our focus right back onto evidence for evolution. AJ, feel free to make a point and then we'll continue going that way. And that that is the biogenetic law. That's why I say that it's no longer taught is because that's what Haeckel thought that that literally human embryos do go through that transition in the womb and become actual fish. And that was wrong. That's why it's no longer taught. So considering it's no longer taught, I don't think that's justification for anything. But um, can you show me a textbook that uh, still, that says that that is how human embryos form, that they literally become fish? Can you show me a textbook that says that? Because I would love to see that. Yes, well, Ken, I, I, think, I think you're on mute, Ken, if, yeah, okay. if, but you're good now. Go okay. Uh, I can't, I'm, we moved to a new desk, so I can't reach my old desk, but I got behind me over here, 2020 textbook. It says, early embryonic development shows similarities in some groups. Some of the strongest anatomical evidence supporting evolution comes from the comparison of how organisms develop. Embryos of different types of vertebrates, for example, often are similar early on but become more different as they develop. Early in, their, early in their development, vertebrate embryos possess pharyngeal pouches, which develop into different structures. Okay, I think all the factories bring in rolls of steel, which develop into different structures by design. And these pharyngeal pouches develop into different structures by design. That doesn't prove a common ancestor. Okay, in humans, for example, they become various glands and ducts. In fish, they turn into gill slits. At a later stage, all primate embryos have a long tail. Monkeys and most primates keep the tail. We and our ape relatives retain the coccyx at the end of our spine. This is another topic. Does the tailbone support evolution? But they are claiming that this is a best evidence. This is one of the best evidences for evolution. This is what the, they, I showed it just a few minutes ago, uh, right here. This was downloaded today, slide number 1957, Alt-DV, 1957. Here we go. The three evidences for evolution, fossils, comparative anatomy, and embryo development. What else do you have? None of those show ancestry. We've never seen a fish embryo develop into anything but a fish, ever. It would not be science to have the fish connected to the elephants and the, uh, let's see, uh, the sunflowers, all going back to a common ancestry. This isn't science. This is religion. That's all it is. And you're welcome to keep your religion, but don't call it science and don't make it mandatory teaching at taxpayer expense. That's not science. So they are teaching it. This was today, downloaded today, BYJU. I forgot to look up what that is, but they said, downloaded today, embryos of various species show similar structure till a certain period. Example, embryos of humans, pigs, reptiles, and birds show similar embryonic development. The fact that they have similar looks from the outside, a roll of steel coming in to make a Corvette, or maybe they don't use steel, maybe aluminum or something, but a roll of steel coming in to make a Chevy Silverado and a roll of steel coming in to make a Ford pickup truck, the rolls of steel look the same. They might have come from the same factory that makes rolls of steel. Wow, you're missing it. They don't have the same number of chromosomes. I think you admitted that. They don't have the same DNA code. They're going to develop into something different. These, let's see, two different thumb drives. Wow, look very similar. Wow, same size. I bet they would both fit in the same hole. Whoa, totally different information on them. Totally different information in those embryos. Totally different. There is no evidence for evolution from embryology. That was the topic of the debate. I win. 
Uh, no, I don't think you win that easily, Ken. So, um, are you are you going to still? Why why is it that you one of your slides you say that textbooks say that human embryos have actual gills like a fish, but that but they don't. You saying that the textbooks say that, but you wrote that on the slide that says they have gills like a fish. All they ever talk about is gill slits, which I I agree with you is a is a misnomer. But again, how can we? Uh, how can how can I help you get how, how can I get those out of the textbooks, Ken? Because I'd like to I'd like to join your your fight to get these out of the textbooks. I think this is actually a good thing that creationists have done, arguing yeah. that that uh, these drawings shouldn't be in textbooks, but for a different reason. I agree that they should be taken out and replaced with microphotographs. Do you agree with that? They should use actual. Now we're it's no problem in today's modern society. We can use actual photographs of all these things. All the textbooks that have these drawings of Haeckel should only be put in there if they're going to say, this was proven wrong a long time ago. Whether the University of Jena did it or not, doesn't matter. It's not true, okay? You could prove it wrong. Get an embryo of each one and look at it yourself. You don't need the University of Jena to decide that. But let me see, do they still have it? Here we go, nope, fake drawings. Let's see, the presence of fish-like structures in embryos. Well, they didn't use the word gill, but they're calling it a fish-like structure. Would you agree that that ought to be removed? Let's say no, all of them have human-like structures. Yeah, you could change it to that if you want. But again, I think they're identical structures. You seem to disagree with that, even though you agree with me that the that the vertebrates have those. Do you agree that all vertebrate embryos have a post-anal tail? It's not a tail. It's the frame being the backbone is laid down first, and then everything goes on. It never is a tail. It is in it, adult monkeys. Oh, in a monkey, they grow a tail. tail. Humans never want to get into a new topic now. Tail. This textbook, biology textbook, uh, 2002, shows it has the word gill slits for all four of them. Wow. The fish, reptile, bird, and human, gill slits. That ought to be taken out, okay? A university textbook. Holt Biology shows a gill pouch. Gill pouch. That ought to be taken out, okay? I think it's the first sure. slide that you, that you show where it says gills like a fish. I don't see any textbook textbook that ever says gills like a fish. And yeah, okay. the, the the tail thing that is is slightly different topic, but it's it's similar in that human embryos. You're right; it doesn't develop into a tail, but it does in other organisms like a monkey. It's very similar to like human embryos in the fish with the actual gills in the adult fish, but they don't develop Here's, into gills in a human. Uh, Ohio, Ohio State University Department of Zoology, Tim Barra. This is a photograph from his book. Uh, let's see uh, these three. The three parallel stages of development of eight vertebrates note how commonly, consistently, the early embryonic stages resemble on one another, a reflection of common ancestry. Uh, they don't have the word gill on that one. They're Kenneth Miller. Uh, I should, I go, I got the, got all these books right here. I'll look for that. That's a good, thank you. Uh, AJ, I'll do that. Uh, let's see. Gill, Holt Biology. Here we go. Note the chicken embryo and human embryo are similar in appearance. This indicates chickens and humans have a more recent common evolutionary ancestry than do fish and chickens. They're using Haeckel's fake drawings on the top one. Those are not the micro photographs. So yes, let's work together. Let's get all the textbooks to only use photographs. Okay, here we go. Gill slits, gill slits on the mammal, the bird, the reptile, the fish. Huh, they're not gill slits. They're folds of skins. And you want to change to pharyngeal arches. Okay. Fish-like structures. Biology concepts. Uh, let's see. This is from today from uh, biolibritex.org. Comparative anatomy. In the study of similarities and differences of embryos, different species, let's see, all vertebrate embryos, for example, have gill slits and tails. They're still using the word gills. Call them. Say, stop, stop. Get that out of there. Okay. Campbell biology from 2017. Textbooks are expensive, okay? I don't, I've got hundreds of them, but getting the new, latest, newest one every time it comes out, they're like a bunch of money for a piece. Uh, a piece. 2017. I agree with you there. I agree. Okay. Pharyngeal arches. Oh, this one doesn't use gills, but does it? At some stage in their development, the vertebrates have a tail located uh, posterior to the anus, referred to as a postanal tail, as well as pharyngeal throat arches. Descent from a common ancestry can explain such similarities. So can common designer explains such similarities. 
Here they're calling them pharyngeal slits. Uh, oh, no, down at the bottom. I almost had it. Fish-like structures go on to be gill slits. Hmm. So they're still using it as evidence, and I think we should use microphotographs only. And then the evidence would diminish. Because now they're, they're, by using Haeckel's fake drawings, they're able to gain some uh, ground on this. Say, wow, look at the similar. Your whole argument tonight has been they look similar. First place, they're not similar. They have very different code. The fact that these look similar means nothing. They both ha could have wildly different code in there. And the fact that they look similar is meaningless. And you're staking your entire eternity on this kind of stuff. I feel bad for you. I pray for you. I really do. Gentlemen, it's been an excellent uh, discussion. I appreciate the free-flowing nature of it. Since we just hit roughly the hour mark, what I think we should do is jump into closing statements. This would be a good time to wrap up our thoughts, wrap up our points. We have an excellent audience tonight with just a ton of audience questions. I really enjoy the audience Q&A portion. And so this will give us uh, plenty of time to engage and interact with the audience and their comments. And so AJ, since you kicked us off with your opening statement now about an hour ago, let's give you the first closing statement. Let's say roughly three minutes each. AJ, go ahead, the floor is yours. All right, well, uh, it seems to me like uh, that Kent agrees with me more than a usual debate because I'm, I'm saying that um, human embryos and all vertebrate embryos that Haeckel's drawings, while I think there was nothing wrong with those original drawings, um, that microphotographs will always be more accurate. And that's what, that's what science does. Um, it's like when they recently announced the a different age for the age of the universe, creationists and flat earthers jumped on that and said, look, um, they're just making these numbers up at random. But no, what they what science does is it zeroes in on a more and more accurate answer. They develop more and more accurate tools and ways to make measurements of different things, different natural phenomena. And then our answers change. But that's not because of the inaccuracy of science. It's actually because of the veracity of science. That's why we've been able to get more and more accurate um, depictions of what we look like as human embryos, which can be shocking for some people to see. It was in the 1850s. Um, the very notion that a human and a dog embryo could look similar was, was very shocking to the, uh, the aristocracy at the time, people who dressed like me. Um, and same thing with evolution. It was very upsetting to the religious, uh, um, the high class of scientists and people there didn't want to accept um, evolution and they didn't want to accept the idea that all humans, um, all races of people came from the same, uh, were the same species. So in science, we, we zero in on a more and more accurate answer and I don't think that that is evidence against the method. I think that just shows that the method works. So it seems like me and Kent fundamentally agree on our position. It's just that he seems to think that it, uh, for different reasons than I do, that these drawings were fake. I don't think the drawings were fake. I don't think that Haeckel was found guilty of fraud. But you're going to see in Kent's next video he does about this, he's going to keep saying that Haeckel was found guilty of fraud and that the University of Jena did a trial. But you saw in this debate that Kent admitted that he does not have evidence of this. He's going to keep saying it anyway, but he doesn't have evidence of it, which I think is classic for Kent. But uh, I think I'll just wrap it up there, Donnie, if that's OK. And uh, yeah, thank you again for hosting. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> definitely. I appreciate it. I agree. It's definitely been a lot of fun. The audience has also enjoyed their time for tonight's debate on embryology. So I think we left no stone unturned on this very interesting topic. So Kent, we're going to throw it uh, back to you now. And you have three minutes for a closing statement. Go ahead. Well, thank you. I think you said recently they changed the uh, age of the earth. Actually, they doubled it, if I recall. I'm seeing the article from 13 billion to 26 billion because they need more time for their frog to turn into a prince. And you said, I'm going to keep using it in my next video, but there's no evidence. I bet you're going to keep using in all your videos that there's evidence for evolution when there is none. You're going to keep using the idea 
that, these, that we have a common ancestry with a frog and a banana and a sunflower. You're going to keep using that, even though there's no evidence anywhere in the world of a protozoa producing a non-baby protozoa. There's no evidence for that. But you're going to continue to support the idea that this kind of stuff should be taught to everybody at taxpayer expense. So yeah, I think we're going to see who the real hypocrite is here uh, real soon. Watch, next video. But uh, I, got, I got the 2020 textbook, the most recent one I have from, uh, let's see, Raven, Johnson, Mason, Losos, and Duncan. I tried to find quickly, uh, I've got some time here, I couldn't get it in time, but I'll get more. They're still using the idea of the embryo having gill slits. It isn't true. And the chromosome number is vastly different on these things. I should look that up. How many chromosome, what's the number of chromosomes in uh, the fish, amphibian, reptile, all the ones that they use as, as uh, supposedly uh, in, in Haeckel's drawings, even in Haeckel's drawings. I don't think they knew at his time about chromosomes and how complex they were. But here, let me get his drawings right here. Haeckel used, let's see, he used a, uh, a fish, a salamander, a turtle, a rabbit, a chicken, a human, a, a duck, a pig, whatever he used there. I'll look it up. And I'm going to flash over the top of each of these. Vastly different DNA code, vastly different. They're not evidence for evolution. So the purpose of the debate tonight was for you to demonstrate that embryology supports evolution. You didn't. I win. Thank you, Donnie. All right. Thank you very much, Kent, for that concluding statement. Gentlemen, again, I appreciate a good, clean, fun, and engaging debate. So good job to the both of you. To the audience, appreciate all the feedback. We've had a lively live chat tonight with quite a few questions. Good mixture of questions as well for the both of you. So let's get right into these. We'll go and start right at the beginning. And so, okay, we got a question here for Kent, one of your biggest fans, creationist crybaby's got a question for you. Kent, snakes have vestigial pelvic bones and some have claws. This corroborates the account in Genesis where snakes once had legs. Why don't whale pelvic bones follow this same pattern? Go ahead. Well, thank you, crybaby, for the question. Uh, whales do not have a vestigial pelvis, and neither do snakes, okay? Snakes, apparently, the Bible says snakes had to crawl on their belly, which means they were not doing that before. So they either had legs or arms or wings, or maybe all three, and they lost something, okay, to crawl, because it's not a curse to crawl on your belly if you're already crawling on your belly. I think we, we could agree with that. They, they're claiming that the whale has a vestigial pelvis or the snake has a vestigial pelvis. This is simply poor science. It's not science at all. It's a lie. Whales have a vestigial pelvis. No, they don't. Whales have bones back in there where we would consider a pelvis if they had one. You have hind limb bones. It says they have no function. This textbook says, Holt Biology. Well, this author ought to be fired, okay? They have no function. Just a male's, imagine whales walking around. It's true. These are the bones they're talking about. Los Angeles Museum of Natural History has got a full-size whale skeleton hanging up there. And those are the bones. I got one in our museum here, the bones, okay? Those bones have nothing to do with walking on land. They're part of the whale's reproductive system. They're necessary for the male whale to make his pelvic thrust to produce a baby whale. The muscles attached there. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with walking on land. They should not call that a vestigial pelvis. This one says, millions of years ago, snakes had legs. Here's the bone right here from our museum. It has a blood supply, a nerve supply. The male, whale, male, male whale's penis is 15 feet long in some species. You have to have special muscles to control that thing. Uh, you got a mate underwater in the dark, and he can't talk and say, screw it over, honey. Got nothing to do with walking on land. Okay, nothing to do with it. So you should stop using that as evidence for evolution. As far as the snake having claws, I've got a picture here. I have in the museum we had in Pensacola, a actual snake skin with the claws on it. Now, let's see, snake, here we go. There's one of the claws, vestigial structures. That's an African python, short claw. It's a vestigial leg, this textbook says. You tell them, Kent Hovind said they're lying or they're stupid. That's the only two choices. They're lying or they're stupid, okay? Those are not vestigial claws. They're not a hind leg on a, on a, let me get my picture here. 
I got so many slides. Okay, we have one of the skins. There it is right there. Albino python, 15 and a half foot long. You look back at the tail and it's got these little claws and bones going up inside. I agree. Again, had nothing to do with walking on land. That's how they can maneuver their partner around to make baby snakes. Some small python males have these as well, these little claws. Here we go. Small python males have these little claws back there. They have nothing to do with walking on land. They're used in mating. So they're not evidence for evolution. They did not evidence the snake lost anything. If they were, stop and think. If they were evidence the snake lost something, where is the evidence of a snake gaining anything? Where is the evidence of a protozoa gaining lungs, ears, eyes, arms, legs, skin, nervous system, central digestive system? Where's the evidence for that? If they were losing legs, that's the opposite of what you guys need for your religion. The exact opposite. Okay, thank you, Kent. AJ, the floor is yours. If there's anything you'd like to respond to or add, go ahead. Oh, AJ, I think you might be on mute. Let me see if it's on my end. Yeah, you're good now. Go ahead. So uh, I'll just say that I don't think the whale pelvic bones follow this pattern because I don't think uh, the account in Genesis is literal history that actually happened. I think that snakes uh, once had legs. I think that is true. But if you look at... Uh, there are some salamander species that don't have legs. And um, when you get into um, that whole group of animals, it becomes kind of confusing about which is which. So to me, I think that seems like it could be good evidence that maybe they're closely related, but that's just because they look similar. We know that doesn't actually mean anything. So I'm done. All right. Thank you, AJ. Kent, a uh, question was for you. You get a, a quick final word if you'd like it. Well, he said something interesting I think you need to focus in on. He said this group of animals. It is man who is deciding to put animals into groups. It's people who decide to put in their shop, to put the hammers in one section and the screwdrivers in another section. The tools don't care where you put them, okay? The animals do not care how we classify them. We've decided the salamanders need to go in this certain category. The snakes go in this category. And if it doesn't meet these criteria, it goes in a different category. The animals aren't, they're not confused at all. You turn all the animals in the world loose all together, the snakes will find the other snakes to mate with. They won't even think about mating with the elephant. Don't even think about it. it our, up on our North 40, we have cows, we have uh, zebus, we have uh, donkeys, we have chickens, we have uh, sheep. They, uh, they know what their kind is. It's, it's man putting these into groups, and that is where part of the problem comes in. We decided, oh, that's a new species. They don't care how we classify them. Go ahead. Can I say something really quick? Go ahead. So uh, you said that animals don't care what we call them, but I've had a dog before and he gets excited when I call him a good boy and he gets sad when I call him a bad boy. So just saying. <laughs> That's proof you and your dog are related. It could be. All right, guys. Appreciate the banter. Here we go. Now we got one for you, AJ. Robin Webster. $5 super chat. Appreciate it. Atheist Jr. Is it analogous to compare biological organisms to factory produced items? Is it possible to determine who created either? Uh, I don't think that it is a good analogy. I think it's not a good analogy because um, we have seen, we can see factories producing things today. We know how they were constructed. We know the history of the industrial revolution and we, we know about human history before we had factories that could mass produce things and before the invention of the assembly line and all of that. And we've seen how it's changed our society, but we haven't, we don't have the same um, observation of creation of biological organisms. Now, so we can determine who created a, a factory item because you can, sometimes you can see written in, like if you have something that's molded from plastic, sometimes they'll write, in the item or on the item, what factory it came from. Or if there's documentation included, you can see where it was created and what company made it. But I don't think we have a, a similar sort of uh, record for biological organisms. So I think it's a bad analogy because with analogies, you have to have um, two different things, but there has to be some one-to-one -one things that you can match between them. Otherwise the analogy falls apart. And I think that's what's happening here. Thank you, AJ. Kent, floor is yours. Go ahead. 
Boy, am I glad to hear him say that. We can see factories produce things. We don't have the same observation of biological organisms. AJ, every farmer in the world has observations of cows producing cows and dogs producing dogs and chickens producing chickens. That we have tons, trillions of examples of observation of biological organisms always producing after their kind. My Bible says 26 times in the first seven chapters, that's what's going to happen. It was predicted. As soon as they were created, God said they're going to produce after their kind. That's a prediction. Wow. And that's all that's ever happened. Cows make baby cows. Sheep make baby sheep. There are no exceptions. None. So, yeah, we have plenty of observation. And I think the factory illustration is the, producing a car is primitive compared to producing a, an organism of anything alive. Really primitive. So I'm sorry. You're dead wrong about that. Thank you, Kent. AJ, you get the last word. Question was for you. Go ahead. Well, the difference in what I was saying is that I'm talking about the creation of something um, out of nothing, creation ex nihilo. And I, I think, uh, or, or creating something where it did not exist before. So we can see something like the invention of nylon where it didn't exist before, but we, we don't see a creation event for new animals. I could argue that we can see speciation in the creation of, or the evolution of new species, but not the creation by uh, an a agent that has a mind. I guess would be my addendum to that uh, argument. Okay, thank you, AJ, for that last word. Super chat from James W. Appreciate the support, and it's a question for you, Kent. A dog, wolf, and coyote look similar, therefore the same kind. Horse and zebra, same kind, right? If embryos look similar, does that mean they're the same kind? Go ahead, Kent. Well, the horse, the dog, the wolf, the coyote can all interbreed. There are coy wolves that are their wolf and coyote have bred and produced offspring. The Bible says if they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Those embryos that he showed, the fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal, they cannot bring forth. The fish cannot mate with the human. Can't do it. It wouldn't work for multiple reasons, okay? So I'm sorry. The fact that they look similar is it does, means nothing. We don't classify dogs, wolves, and coyotes in the same category because they look similar. We classify them in the same category because they can reproduce. That was the biblical qualification. Can they make a baby that is also fertile? That's typically the definition of species. Can they make offspring that are, the, in, in addition, they are fertile. We get to the fringe of the kind, like the Chihuahua and the Great Dane. Maybe they can't produce anymore with each other, probably for mechanical reasons, okay? But they're still the same. They're still in the dog. Man has decided there, this is the dog kind, and there are 339 breeds of dogs, most of which would not survive on their own in the woods. Okay, they're human developed that. Same with the cows. 450 breeds of cows, most of which would not survive in the wild. If you turn all the cows in the world loose, probably 90% of them would die off because they can't make it. They got farmers got to bring them their food, or they die. The rest of them, the wild ones, know how to find their food. So I think the fact that they look similar, horse and zebra can be crossbred. Okay, a zorse they make it, I think they call it. Depends which one is the male, which one's the female. But um, the look, it's not, they're not the same kind because they look similar. They're the same kind because they can reproduce. Okay, thank you, Kat. AJ, floor is yours if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think this uh, question is a good question because I think Kent's uh, draw or his diagram of the horse, the dog, wolf, coyote, and the banana is meant to be ask a, like a four-year-old and they're probably going to answer based on how the animals look. They don't know if the dog, wolf, and coyote can interbreed. I, would, I wouldn't think. Um, so I think this is, the question makes a lot of sense. And uh, I think similarity, things looking similar does matter. If you've ever heard the phrase, if it looks like a duck, talks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it's probably a duck. Well, you can apply that here as well. Kent, you get the last word. Go ahead. Well, if, if there's a slogan to back it up, that makes it true. I mean, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, that proves, you know, that proves something to somebody. So I think we would agree that the DNA code of the dog, the wolf, the coyote are similar enough. They can interbreed. Let's see. What do you say? The horse and the zebra. Horse and dogs cannot interbreed. And man is so excited about putting his, his classification system on these animals. Just turn them loose. They know what they look like. They will find a partner. Okay. We don't need to help them at all. They'll, they'll find it. So the fact that the, the embryos, 
the fact that they look similar is a great question. If, uh, James, you really believe this is true, why can't those embryos that look similar ever interbreed at any stage of their life? If you take those embryos and let them develop into adults, none of them can interbreed ever. Huh. I guess they were different from the start, weren't they? Thank you, Kent. Okay, we got one for you now, AJ. Patty Smith, $10 Super Chat. Appreciate the support. And the question for you, AJ, is this. If survival of the fittest is the primary driver of all evolution, predators almost always go after the babies or eggs who don't stand a chance regardless of their fitness. How would you like to well, respond to that, AJ? Well, I don't know if uh, <clears throat> survival of the fittest is a primary driver of evolution. I would say that the mechanisms of evolution is... Uh, Creation myths taught us is uh, is um, mutations, uh, natural selection, uh, sexual selection, genetic drift, things like that. Survival of the fittest is more of just uh, something that's a term related to Darwin Darwinian evolution. It's not really something that's used today. Um, I'm not really sure what the question is asking, but I think that predators. Uh, would go after babies or eggs because they're an easy target. Although you could even make an argument that some eggs have a leathery coating, which might be more difficult to pierce, and some might have a, a soft calcium coating that would make them less fit if you want to look at it that way. And that's based on the species that the, uh, the parent was. So I think there's even an argument for uh, fitness there. But yeah, I'm not exactly sure what they're asking. So. Okay, thank you, AJ. Kent, any thoughts? I think survival of the fittest is a lousy expression. It's actually survival of the luckiest in most cases. Not survival of the fittest. It sometimes may be a little bit, but it's survival of the luckiest. And the eggs are right, they're defenseless. The embryos, the babies are, are defenseless. So yeah, it's, it's survival of the fittest is simply not true. That's what Darwin's title, subtitle of his book was, okay? And I think he was wrong. It's survival of the luckiest. Thank you, Kent. AJ, you get the last word if you'd like it. Uh, that's okay. All right. We've got another one from Creationist Crybaby. This will be for you, Kent. An atavism is the reappearance of a character present in a distant ancestor, but lost in an organism's immediate ancestors. Why do we see atavisms consistent with organisms evolutionary history. Go ahead, Ken. Your whole statement is based on a presumption. You start off making a claim, which you haven't demonstrated. You don't know that they have a distant ancestor. You start off with a crazy claim and then now make another claim on top of that. Well, let me make one for you, crybaby. If elephants could fly, we should not be under them when they're having to go potty. Okay? Elephants can't fly. The original statement is false. Your, your original statement is that you said, atavism is the reappearance of a character present in distant ancestor. You don't know that. That's not science. Keep, keep crying though, go ahead. Thank you, Kent. AJ, anything you'd like to add? Uh, just what I've been <clears throat> arguing during this debate, which is that early embryos of various species display ancestral features like the tail on human embryos. Okay, thank you, AJ. Kent, any final words on that one? Well, the features they have, like the tail, is uh, part of the backbone. It never is a tail. It's a part of the backbone. The, the, the tail bone is not vestigial, that's for sure. It's part of nine muscles attached to it. It's got a nerve supply, blood supply, cartilage in between. It's uh, very effective for posture, for, uh, for mating, for all sorts of things. You need your tailbone. I've said hundreds of times, if anybody thinks the tailbone is vestigial and you don't need it, I will pay to have yours removed. I'll, do, I, I'll, I'll remove it myself. Come on over. I got my Swiss Army knife. Just sharpened it yesterday. We'll take it right out. I know right where it's at. All right. Thank you, Kent. Creationist uh, Crybaby. Appreciate the question. All right. Next question is for you, AJ. We got two people with the same question. Kevin here and C4C Apologetics. Their question for you is, what would convince you of God is what Kevin asked. And C4C uh, is specific in terms of creationism. What are your thoughts, AJ? A handwritten letter addressed to me from God. All right, there we go. 
Kent, any thoughts? No, nothing will convince him. Okay. The Bible says in Romans chapter one, when people get to a certain stage of rejecting God, God gives them up. You read Romans chapter one, he gives them up, he gives them up, he gives them over. I pray that's not the case with AJ, but I suspect it is. He, he wouldn't, if God himself wrote a letter, he wouldn't believe it. He wants to believe in evolution badly. He wants to be an right. animal. AJ, go ahead. You got a final word if you'd like it. Well, um, I would argue that uh, animals have been shown to show empathy, like elephants who have graveyards and monkeys, uh, chimpanzees who mourn the deaths of their relatives. And I think that, or dogs, I think it's obvious that dogs can show emotion. So I think maybe uh, humans being animals might not be such a bad thing after all. Okay, next question for you, AJ. Subtle moments of absurdity. So he's wondering, even if your argument about embryos is 100% true, doesn't it still require a leap of faith to say that it means there is no creator? I like that username. And uh, I guess you could you could say uh, yes, but I don't know if that's really what I was arguing here because what I'm arguing is uh, just that I think that it shows that ev ev uh, evolution is more likely, that common ancestry is more likely than the alternative um, because you can still, there are a lot of people who are Christians who are theistic evolutionists and think that um, God guided the process of evolution. Uh, I think that argument only gets you to a deistic God or a, uh, a non-specific God. But yeah, um, I think you could say that it's a jump, but I also think it's a jump to say that um, there was a common designer and I know that that designer is my specific Christian God versus uh, a God from a different religion. I think that's also a leap. So. Thank you, AJ. Kent, any thoughts on that one? Oh, I admit mine's a faith. He will never admit his is a faith. He will never admit evolution is a religion. You have to believe in it. We don't observe any animal or plant producing anything other than their kind. He believes they did, though, long ago and far away. We don't, it doesn't happen today, but it happened in the past. And fossils have this magic ability to do something that no animal today can do, produce something other than their kind. I think God wrote a handwritten letter and said, AJ, all the animals are going to bring forth after their kind. He said it 26 times in the first seven chapters. That's all we've ever seen. I think that's scientifically accurate. But okay. I don't want to believe it. So, okay. It's been two hours, Donnie. I had a long day. I got in at three this morning, driving up to Atlanta and back. So can we be done here soon? Yes, no worries. We got a final word for AJ. One last question, and we're going to wrap it up. It's been a fun 90 minutes. Kent, I know you did a pre-show. And then AJ, you have an after show. So it's been a busy night for the both of you. I appreciate your time. AJ, final word if you'd like it. Um, just, uh, I would just want to say thank you to Donnie for hosting this and, and Kent for, for, you know, doing the debate. And I had a, I had a good time. So I'm, I'm glad uh, that, you know, glad we took the time to do it. So thank you to both of you. Well, I appreciate that, AJ. I guess I meant final word on this question. Then we'll get another final word after <laughs> the, we got one more super chat from Mr. Archaeopteryx. Then we'll do final, final words, AJ, but I do appreciate okay. that. So this one just came in last minute. We'll consider it a bonus one, $20. It's for Kent. So let's see what we got here. Kent, horses, donkeys, and zebras all have different chromosome counts. How many times does this have to, well, he's being a little rhetorical here, but he's coming at you, Kent. So how would you like to respond? <laughs> he says, different chromosome counts does not preclude the organisms being related. What are your thoughts, Kent? Spicy. Well, how, how Spicy. different are they? Is there a lot of similar code? There are probably billions of identical lines of code between these. There may be some different chromosome numbers. If, and maybe the fact that they can still reproduce is an amazing design feature. They've had airplanes with three wheels come in and land where one wheel was flat and they were able to land on two. Whoa, amazing design feature. The pilot has to be trained to land it with one wheel out or one landing gear won't come down. So I think the fact that there are different animals, horses, I think horses, donkeys, and zebras mating with different chromosome numbers is not evidence that horses are related to sunflowers. Leave. Thank you, Kat. Any thoughts, AJ? Yeah, I think that the different chromosome counts was just kind of a, a moving of the goalposts to the argument that embryos look similar, that vertebrate embryos look similar in their early stages because Kent then says, well, what about the chromosome number? I think that's just a way of sort of avoiding the, the main argument. It's moving the goalposts, in my opinion. 
And Kent, final word. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. By that standard, wow. humans and chimps are related, by the way. All right, Kent, you get the oh. final word on this question if you'd like. These look very similar. Two thumb drives. Totally different information in between. Okay. The fact that the embryos look similar on the outside has nothing to do with evolution. Doesn't prove anything. As far as common ancestry, the topic of the debate tonight was, does embryology prove evolution? And all he's given all night is they look similar. They look at them. They look similar. They look similar. First place, they don't look similar if you look close. Secondly, that doesn't mean anything. These look similar. That's not what's important. They got a totally different code. They obviously develop into totally different animals. They're not similar. They're not. At any stage, they're not similar. Okay, gentlemen, that wraps up the Q&A. That's 90 minutes. I think this was an excellent debate on the topic of embryology. I appreciate you gentlemen being willing to do a fourth formal debate. I would argue that all four of your debates are must-watch exchanges. So let's get some quick final words, final thoughts. We'll start with you. Kent, again, thank you so much for doing this. And go ahead, final words, final thoughts. Well, I think Pascal's wager fits really good here. If he's right, I haven't lost anything. I've had a wonderful life. I enjoy life. If I'm right and he's wrong, he's lost a lot. I can't lose either way. He's going to lose bad if he's wrong. He better keep on digging, looking for evidence for evolution. I think he's chosen a silly religion to believe in. I feel sorry for you. But go ahead. Thank you, Kent. AJ, final words? Well, I, my response to Pascal's wager would simply be that there is an equal chance that you could find out after you die that you get to an afterlife where you're punished for being Christian and believing in Jesus. So I, I don't see any any reason why that's more or less likely. Um, but yeah, um, Kent, after this whole debate, he's still arguing that uh, the embryos don't look similar. I hate to be, belabor the point, but I think it's important to the argument. And um, I just want to re re reinstate that uh, there was no trial that Haeckel was held under. That is just a lie made up by creationists. So I just wanted to say that one more time. And thank you. Saying there was no trial, did you? He does not know that. Earlier, he said there is no evidence. Now he's saying there was no trial. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You better be careful there, son. You way stepped over the line on that one. You don't know that. All right, gentlemen. Good, good, fun, entertaining and clean debate. So we're going to let Kent get out of here. And also AJ, thank you for being here. And I will stick around for a little bit just to go over some reminders and announcements. From my understanding, there's an after show over on the uh, Mr. Anderson channel. So do uh, check that out if you're interested in continuing the discussion. This was strictly a formal debate. But for those that enjoy our two-in-one uh, event nights. We do have one coming up on Friday. So we've got four in a row for you tonight, of course, the much anticipated throwdown in the debate octagon between uh, Kent Hoven and Atheist Jr. I enjoyed it. I'm glad it went well, and I'm glad we got a good fourth formal debate out of these two uh, best friends. So, okay, so we had tonight, tomorrow we'll be back for a debate on full preterism. Lots of hype for this one. Lots of excitement. I see people all over Facebook, YouTube, social media talking about this one. We've got two powerhouses in the world of debates. Dr. Don Preston, Chris Date, they are going to be debating specifically the topic of the resurrection of the dead. And I am excited for this one. This one starts at 7 EST and it is definitely going to be a debate that you don't want to, to miss. So that'll be uh, tomorrow. Then on Friday, we do have another debate between, uh, well, this one with Kent and Doc. And so this should be fun. Does the geologic column exist? Great question. And Doc and Kent are going to duke it out on this question in the debate octagon. This will be a two-in-one event. And so how we have this debate structured is the first hour will be Kent and Doc. They're going to engage the topic, specifically the geologic column. And then we're going to have an hour open mic where people can join to debate specifically the geologic column. We want to keep it on topic. And then at the two-hour mark, when Kent 
leaves. We're going to open it up for another couple hours, probably, of uh, probably in terms of that's roughly how long we'll go of just general open mic creation, evolution, ancestry, so on and so forth. So that should be fun. That'll be on Friday. Again, two in one event. Make sure you're here for this one. It's it's a continuation in our open mic challenge that we've been hosting and putting on. Speaking of open mic challenges, we got an exciting one for everybody this Tuesday. Paul Price, Ian Juby, two prominent speakers in the world of Young Earth Creation. I am thrilled to have these brothers here for a show dedicated to poly straight trees. Ian Juby's done a lot of uh, study on this. So has Paul Price. He's written about it on creation.com. And so they've been putting a lot of work into this topic for this show. And so they're going to be discussing poly straight trees as evidence for young earth and a global flood. And the challenge is out there to the evolutionary community to join and engage both Paul and Ian on the topic of poly straight trees. And so I'm excited for this one. Echoing Erudite says, Ian Juby. Yes, I'm excited to have him as well. He's put out a lot of excellent content on the creation versus evolution topic. So that one will be Tuesday though. We'll be wrapping up this week specifically with, so we're giving you a good diversity of topics. Guys, we're giving you a little bit on creation of it. We don't want to be a one or two trick pony. We at Standing for Truth Ministries want to give you a little bit of everything. So we got soteriology, nature of God, dispensationalism, Israel, eschatology, creation evolution, all, all, all of these important topics. So this one coming up, a debate this Saturday, two seasoned debaters, dispensational salvation, Charles Jennings, David Preston. This is actually an end game debate between these two gentlemen. And so the question they're going to be engaging is specifically, did Paul and James teach different gospels? So if you are a debate addict like myself and so many here in a healthy way, in a healthy way, again, it gets us out of our uh, theological echo chambers and puts us into the debate octagon, debate dojo to uh, engage each other, those of differing views on these topics in, in a professional manner. And so do make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss these debates. Creationist Crybaby, thank you for the good questions. Cheryl asks, what about the flat earth? There's nothing to fear but the sphere itself. You know, we've had one debate on the flat earth, and that was a great debate. If, if I remember correctly, it was Dr. Robert Singenis and Nathan Erickson, if I'm remembering that correctly. And that was a good debate, but we haven't done a flat earth debate since then. If I'm going to do a flat earth debate, I'd want to make it worth it. That debate I think was worth it because uh, Dr. Sengenis, he's written a thousand page book on it. He's done numerous formal debates. He knows the science. Uh, Nathan, he's put a lot of work into it too. So I think uh, matching those two up made for a good debate and it wasn't a dumpster fire. So that's what I want to avoid with, uh, with these kinds of debates. Echoing erudite says <laughs> creation myths cracks me up, but I do appreciate them. So echoing erudite says for me, debates are the best way to get introduced to a different subject. Yes. And I think it's a good way to learn about different positions in a way where we're not straw manning them. I mean, especially in the world of theology debates, you know, we get solid representatives of all different sides of, of these issues. And so we get a, a solid understanding of, of different topics, even positions or viewpoints that we might uh, not necessarily agree with. And so, okay, next Tuesday, open mic with Paul Price and Ian Juby. And then immediately following that one, we are going to be having our debate here, two versus two, Protestants versus Catholics. So I know a lot of people have been looking forward to this one. And again, it is happening. And it is going to be Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken. The Immaculate Conception. The last time we did this was maybe about eight months ago. I don't know. Time flies by when you're having fun. 
But that debate, that was on the assumption of Mary. That was our last two versus two, Catholics versus Protestants. And that set a record. We had about a thousand live for that show. Still uh, getting a lot of good feedback, that debate. So obviously a lot of people are interested in this topic. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we had our great Trinity debate between Anthony Rogers and Sean Griffin. That saw about 600 live. So this one is going to be a, an exciting one. Protestants versus Catholics, Immaculate Conception, Biblical and Ancient. So that's next Wednesday. Then we are pretty close into April. So January, February, and March have been a, a blast. We've had quite a few interesting debates for people to examine and reflect on. And April's no different. April's the month of soteriology. So I put a lot of work over the last few months into scheduling three main events in the world of soteriology for April. And they're all up on the channel. All the details are confirmed, good to go. And so we'll be kicking that series of debates off with A.K. Richardson, Pastor Tommy McMurtry. Showdown on Once Saved, Always Saved. I'm definitely excited for this one. Both these gentlemen are passionate about this topic. Then we've got Dr. Bob Wilkin and Sean Griffin, the great James 2 debate, controversial passage. This should be fun. We need more exegetical debates because these, these passages alone could take a solid two to three hours to adequately engage. Then we've got Dr. Robertson Jennison, and Chris Morrison. The great salvation debate is justification by faith alone. And so we got those three for you in April. And guys, this is just an overall snapshot of the overall material that we have for everybody. I've just scheduled another three or four debates on the King James only issue, the Bible translation issue. I'm working on several more in the world of creation versus evolution. So for those that want to enter the debate octagon or debate dojo, feel free to email me at standingfortruthministries at gmail.com. Let me know what your favorite topics are to debate. If you have interlocutors that you'd like to debate or recommend, uh, provide me that information as well. And I'll do my best to fit you into the schedule for 2024, the year of debate. So with that, thank you to all of the uh, skeptics and non-skeptics who have joined tonight and hopefully have enjoyed this debate between Dr. Dino and Atheist Jr., as much as I have. Actually, one, one thing I wanted to remind people is we have been uh, mixing in this Soteriology open mic series. With everything going on on the channel, we're hosting about four or five events a week. we got a lot going on behind the scenes. Matt and I, we're coming close to finalizing our quest for Noah movie. You guys are going to love it. we got some cool AI in it. It's we got uh, cool interview clips in it. You guys are really going to love this, this movie we've been working on. We're probably going to release that for May because although we're well into it, into, into the process, we want to leave no stone unturned, make sure it's perfect for you. So we're doing a lot behind the scenes, but I've been, when I can, implementing these soteriology open mics. So, so far we've done two, uh, engaging Bible flock box, but allowing uh, people to join for impromptu discussion and debate. So we just did one last night, actually. And so that's up on the channel. We went for a few hours. We had some great impromptu debate, uh, Baptists and Seventh-day Adventists going at it on the topic of soteriology. I thought it was a lot of fun. So if you haven't yet seen that one, again, it is up on the channel. Do make sure uh, to check it out from last night. And if you love the topic of soteriology, I think you'll have a lot of fun with that. So, okay, we're going to wrap things up. I appreciate all the support, feedback. Cam, yes, great question. If you look in the uh, playlist section, go to, and or, you know what? Go to the End Time Theology Series by Donnie B. I've got about 30 or 35 videos in there, including at least one of the formal debates that I've done on the rapture. And so I did one a couple of years back, maybe year and a half to two years ago when I was writing my book on the topic and I did it with J.D. Morin. So this is my book on end times theology, end times revealed, Dawn of the Antichrist. So I have engaged in uh, several debates on that topic, one uh, formal debate. And Cam, you should be able to find that in the playlist titled 
end times theology series by Donnie B. Or if you just type in Donnie Badinsky versus JD Morin on the rapture, it should pop up. Oh, Doki, I appreciate it, brother. My veteran mods, Doki Doki, Cheryl, and Honesty Angel. Excellent job tonight, as always. I do appreciate it. So there is the playlist for you. Check that out. Again, up roughly 30, about 36 videos, actually, because I just put out another one on the timeline of the resurrection, and I made sure to leave no stone unturned. I got into premillennialism, amillennialism. And I touched on a number of important eschatological related topics. So check that out. Endless content, endless material. I try to leave no stone unturned on the topic of eschatology. So if that is a topic that you're most interested in, utilize the, the material in that playlist. And so let's see if we got any last questions. We also did a mini Q&A last night in our open mic, as there were some questions and comments in the chat. Uh, last night for last night's soteriology open mic questions dealing with the book of life and uh the timeline of the resurrection and so if you watch that show you'll find some answers to to those questions here's the show right here doki appreciate it uh i also at the end of this show i spent about 30 ish minutes on the apparent age model or viewpoint in terms of it, it's a viewpoint within the young earth creation camp and it's called the apparent age model. I provide my thoughts on that, including what I believe is a more balanced approach or viewpoint to this issue. And I get into what I prefer, which is functional maturity rather than apparent age. So check out that video right there. Uh, you get a little bit of, of everything in there, ranging from eschatology to soteriology, and then also the apparent age position, which has stirred up a little bit of controversy uh, lately. And so I enjoy providing my input. This is the open mic we did last night. We spent a lot of time on Hebrews 10. So those that love soteriology, again, we just want to get people out of their echo chambers, whether it's theology-related echo chambers, creation versus evolution-related echo chambers, and get people into the debate dojo, as I like to call it, for some, some good discussion on these topics. So, okay. To my mods, thank you so much. I do appreciate it. Again, we'll be back tomorrow for the much anticipated debate between Chris Date and Dr. Don Preston on full preterism. We have hosted just a ton of debates on end time theology, dispensationalism, and Israel and the timing of the rapture. So you can check that playlist as well. I think it's titled something like Dispensationalism and End Times Theology Debates Hosted by Standing for Truth. You'll find endless content there for uh, the debate addicts out there that, that want to dig into these top topics and examine them. There's a lot of information for you to, to examine. Uh, J.C. says Hebrews 10, 26 is scary. I put a lot of work into studying uh, Hebrews 10. And I put out over an hour video or lecture on Hebrews 10. So you can find that on the channel as well. I've debated it uh, numerous times in informal and formal settings. But last night in the open mic, we spent quite a bit of time interacting with, with Hebrews 10. So it's a comprehensive breakdown uh, on, on that topic. So it's important. Yes, dispensationalism versus uh, covenant theology or Reformation theology, you know, there's different names. And we've done quite a few debates on that. That's that's a very interesting topic because there's a lot of good points on both sides. And I like to see how both sides interact with each other's points and counter each other's arguments. So we got plenty of debates on that as well. Doki, Doki, you get an A plus tonight, brother. You get a promotion. So there we go. Hebrews 10. For if we sin willfully, this is something I did a couple of years ago. I left no stone unturned. You'll see a lot of slides, a lot of images, a lot of cross-referencing uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, looking at the book of Hebrews, looking at Numbers, Deuteronomy. And I really do leave no stone unturned in terms of uh, demonstrating that Hebrews 10 does not teach conditional security. So do please check that out. Fallen World says, God bless you, Donnie, and everyone. Uh, God bless you as well. And so I think we're going to wrap things up. This has been a fun 
reminders and announcements uh, segment here on Standing for Truth. Stay tuned for <laughs> Cheryl. Yeah, Doki's impossible to beat. He's he's the champ. He he can't be beat on getting those links in time. So, all right, I appreciate it, moderators. You did a great job tonight. I've been looking forward to this debate, and I'm just thrilled that it turned out well. I really wanted to make sure that this debate was professional, that is it was as cordial as possible, but I really wanted this topic to be engaged extensively. I wanted this to be the go-to debate on the topic of embryology in relation to evidence for evolution. And I think it was, we got a solid 90 minutes, including almost 60 minutes of back and forth discussion. And the banter was good. It was healthy. It was engaging. It, it was entertaining. I think it was a good debate overall. So share it around, watch it a couple more times, examine the arguments, be ob objective. That's all we ask for is be objective when you're watching these debates as you are challenging your worldviews, challenging the viewpoints that, that you may hold to. And so, okay, thanks for tuning in, everybody. God bless. And Standing for Truth is out.